Well, good morning again, Fellowship. Good to have you with us uh, today. Uh, when we've been, uh, when we're shooting this this week, um, we've seen many days where it's been a, a, a lot of snow falling outside and blowing around. And, and maybe you're like me and you think that, wow, we got through Easter, warm weather is coming, uh, where, where there's hope for that. And then several days this week, we've woken up to snow on the ground and wondering, wow, is, is spring ever coming? And, uh, and I'm sure it is, I'm sure it is, I'm, I'm holding out hope on that, but, but uh, for me, I think just this whole situation would feel a whole lot better if you could just get out and enjoy some sunshine. So we're praying for that and, and hope that in the days to come uh, that we will feel some, some warmth in the sun uh, instead of the snow that's been blowing this week. But it's good to have you with us this morning. Uh, we're going to have a, a couple of new things happen this week that I hope you uh, enjoy and appreciate. Uh, just to let you know what's sort of coming up ahead of time too, we'll give you a quick rundown on that. This, today we're going to have a short testimony uh, by one of our deacons, Ron, and he's going to share just what Jesus has been doing in his life in recent days. We look forward to that. And, and so you'll be seeing more of these in the weeks to come. As long as we're doing church like this, we're going to try and connect people as much as we can. So just sort of to look back on where we've been in recent days as far as the topics of our messages, just wanted to remind you of, of all of them uh, way back, way back when this whole um, shutdown of, of gatherings together started, we, we did a series of, of messages. And they started with the idea of being courageous and not being stirred up. Uh, then we talked about being comforted by the God who, who tells us to be comforted because of who he is. Then the God that gives us hope. And so we were holding on to hope. And then we talked about the future and the importance of understanding what the future holds for us and, and, and what the implications of that are and why it's important for us to know for sure um, our future and what, what our eternal destiny is and why that's so important. Easter brings that to light. And as we uh, celebrated last week, both on Good Friday and on Easter Sunday, um, we were just reminded again of the power of the resurrection of Christ and, and how that brings hope and that brings this certainty of a future, um, what we call eternal life. Uh, it makes it available to everyone who trusts Christ as their own personal Savior. So that's kind of where we've been. Um, as we pick it up this week, we're going to start um, thinking of, of what comes next. We're thinking of going forward now. So in light of what we talked about, I want to bring a message of, of encouragement to get going and doing. And then uh, next week, we're going to start back into our study on the book of Acts. And so you can be sort of thinking about that as well as we go forward. We trust that you enjoy the, the service today, the testimony, the the, the song that we're going to share in worship and uh, the, the truth of God's word. Uh, we just pray it'll all be a blessing to your hearts today. It's coming on the clouds, kill the kingdoms will bow down. It's every chain will break, it's broken Declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. It's every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before yeah. So open up the gates, they claim before the king. Stop the Lord Almighty, yeah. And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. As every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood. Yeah. 
message that I've got for us, for all of us, to consider uh, comes out of the book of 2 Corinthians. So if you have a Bible, you can turn there. Um, we're just going to look at a few verses in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So we're just going to go to those two spots today and tie a thought together, I hope. Um, as you're doing that, just to give you the quick background for the book, um, the Apostle Paul has traveled and been to Corinth. And, and he's started a church and wrote them a letter, and they were having some struggles, some big problems, and he wrote them a, another letter, and, uh, and, and so he's had this dialogue through the mail, in some ways, with, with the, the church in Corinth. And as he sort of dialogued with them, he wanted to help them get over these rough patches they were going through. And, and so really, the, what we call Second Corinthians isn't the second letter, it's maybe the third or the fourth letter uh, that the Apostle Paul has written to them to encourage them, to build them up. We have this one preserved for us, and we call it 2 Corinthians, and it's again a, a letter of encouragement, it's a, it's a letter of prodding and pushing a little bit too. And so um, that's my hope today, is to encourage you and to prod and push a little bit as well. So grab your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're just going to read a few verses, um, and we're going to start reading at verse 3, and, and we're just going to, to get an idea, a thought that comes out of it. It ties back all the way uh, to the very beginning of our series of messages we, we started as we began this online process. So read with me. This is verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Well, the apostle is really just trying to get their attention in some ways and wants to, to let them know his goal is to encourage them, to bring comfort. But it's not necessarily going to come the way they expected, and it may not be packaged as nicely as they had hoped. But here's the reminder. Here's the reminder to people that he cares about a lot. He's, he's engaged with them, and he's had correspondence with them, and they're people that he has come to care about. And so he wants to share with them some concerns, but some hope as well. So he starts out by telling these people that were probably being pushed to the sides of society and having some struggles of their own because of their faith and trust in Jesus. Because they were, they were being pushed to the, the, the sides of their culture and they were absolutely countercultural in a lot of ways. Life wasn't always easy. And so, so in the middle of those struggles that are coming as a result of, of their faith in Jesus, the Apostle Paul gives them 
these words. Blessed be to God and Father, verse 3, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Two points there I want to just sort of stop and, and remind us of. And it's easy to sort of blow over these words. But it's really important. He calls God the Father or the originator of mercy. In other words, um, the, the blessings that we get... In the, in the middle of, of tough times, those mercies that we get are a result of God working in our lives. The, the, the idea of mercy is, is, is sort of not giving us the, the whole dose that we really do deserve. Um, and, and so in, in a lot of ways, God is, is, is standing between the struggles of life and, and his people and, and being merciful. He's, he's helping them through the difficult patches of life. And, and if you could probably describe the last month or two of our experiences here, um, literally around the world, it might be struggles and challenges and trials. So, so in some ways, we have to look at it and say, if we're okay, and the people we love are okay, and, and we're, we're, we've got sort of roof over our heads and, and food in the fridge and, and we're okay, that's a, that's a result of God's mercy, the originator of mercy. Because it could have been a whole lot worse. Then it says this, and he calls him not just the father of mercies, but here's the connection point back to our thoughts on of Isaiah a few weeks ago. He is, he's also called the God of all comfort. And remember, God's call through Isaiah was to comfort his people, to comfort his people. In the midst of struggles and the midst of challenges, God said to comfort his people. And, and here's the Apostle Paul saying that, that the God that we worship is the God of all comfort. And he could have just said the God of comfort, but he didn't. He chose to include the word all. And here's, I think, the lesson that the apostle was trying to get through to them. Because they're probably like you and me. They're, they're probably exactly like you and me, or we're exactly like them. They were probably in the midst of, of difficult, challenging times looking for comfort in a variety of places. And I've, I've heard sort of some jokes on, uh, on radio and television uh, with, with this confinement thing, how people are, are, are recognizing that the clothes that they were wearing before are getting just a little tighter than they were before. And, and sometimes we, we look for comfort. We look for comfort in, in food. Guilty as charged. And, and, and that's, what, that's what we do. And, and so... so in some ways, having a full stomach of the foods that we love, whatever that might be, makes us feel okay. It, it makes us feel like we're home. It makes us feel like we're going to get through this. Uh, other people find comfort in different things. Um, I've, I've heard of I, this I don't understand at all, so just put that right out there. But I've heard of people saying that, that, that going and buying things, shopping, uh, even online, is a, is a source of comfort. That boggles my mind in every possible way, but um, that may be what it is that we're trying to, to fill that void with. Maybe it's, maybe it's surrounding ourselves with our family, you know, just sort of collecting everybody together and, and saying, well, if we're all here and we're all okay, then, then, then it's okay. And we find comfort in that. And, and I'm not trying to suggest those are bad things. Any of those are bad things. I just, I'm just saying that that we can go and look for comfort in lots of places. But the Apostle Paul says that, that, that when we run to God, he's actually the source of comfort. He's the, the God of, I like this word, all comfort. There's really nowhere else to go to really get the comfort that our soul, that our heart is really looking for. That, that warm, fuzzy feeling that we want isn't going to be found anywhere other than in a relationship with a God who says, comfort my people. A God who says, I'm there for you through it all. A God who says, 
I care for you. I have a plan. I have a, I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you a future. I love you. I care for you. And I love you so much, I died for you. It's in that God that we find real, real comfort. So there's verse 3 of, of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And then I want us just to sort of see what's going on. He says, so when does this God of all comfort show up? When does this God of all comfort sort of invade our lives? Well, he comes and comforts us when we need him the most. Look at what it says. The God who comforts us in our affliction, verse 4. And, and so, so it's when we need him, God shows up. When, when we need him, God is there with us. He's described as the one who sticks closer than a brother. He's described as the one who will never leave us. He's, he's the one that's, that describes as, as the presence that is with us, above us, in front of us, behind us, beside us. The book of Psalms talks all about, about all of those places where our God is. And so it's just a reminder that, that God is the one who's there because he knows what we're going through. And he comforts us in our affliction. See, he never leaves us as the casualty of anxiety. He, he never leaves us as the one who's being pounded by the struggles of life or overwhelmed by the temptations that it brings. But he's the one that, that holds onto us and bears us up in all of the trials and all the difficulties of life. He's the one who comforts us in our affliction, in the hard points of life, in this stuff that we're going through right now. We can get comfort through a relationship with God. Then I want us to see that he comforts us. That's the first point. That's a good thing. He comforts us in all our affliction. But that's not the end of the verse. It's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the purpose that he has. And here's really what I'm trying to get across to all of us today. The struggles, the challenges, the, the things that are frustrating us today shouldn't mean the end of us being able to make a difference in our world. I'm reminded that the Apostle Paul spent a lot of time on his own. He was free when he wrote this book, but a lot of the books in the New Testament that he, he sent to people, he wrote when he was in jail, in prison, isolated. Self-isolated, not his doing in some ways. And so to, to think that just because we're in this situation means we can't do anything is not true. So, so I want you to see why God comforts his people and why he comforts us. So let's keep reading in verse 4. Because he doesn't comfort us just to make us feel better. Although that's really awesome. And that's really great. And I'm all in on that. I, it's not that I'm disappointed that, that God comforts us to make us feel like we're going to be Okay, we're going to get through this, and God has a plan and a purpose, and he gives us hope. I got, I got all that. I get that. I get that. But that's not the end of the story. And I want us to see what it is. So he says he comforts us in our affliction, verse 4 says. But now here's the part I want you to underline in your Bible or, or highlight in your tablet or whatever it is. So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. You see, God doesn't comfort us so that we can sit and be satisfied. God comforts us so that we can do. And if there's any point to what I'm trying to communicate to us today is that the comfort we get from God needs to lead us to action. It, it doesn't let us sit and be static. It doesn't let us be stationary and satisfied. It, it's got to move us on to doing something bigger and better than what we're doing right now. And so when we get comfort, it is not so that we feel better. It's so that we can, can go to someone else and say, let me tell you what God has done for me. 
Let me tell you about the hope that I have because of my relationship with him. And let me tell you about his goodness. And let me tell you about hope. So we'll be able to comfort those who are any affliction. So it's not for ourselves. Instead, it's driving us to action. And then it says this, like, and when we comfort people, not with our own words, but, but with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted by God. That's the end of that verse. In our affliction, just giving a little bit, or until we feel like we've done enough, really isn't good enough. Because God doesn't just comfort us a little bit. We don't just go to someone and say, hey, thinking about you, um, let, just checking in, I and see how you're feeling, and tick the box and say we're done. See, people may have some really, some really significant needs in your world. And, and you might be able to be the one that can really help them. In fact, you might be the one that God is, is suggesting needs to get involved in their life and to encourage them and to comfort them when, when they're in, in struggle. I can't imagine that single person, weeks on end, in an apartment, in a house, by themselves, Give them a call. Send them an email. Just let them know that you care. Maybe you're the one that that God is saying, you need to go and bring comfort to them as I've comforted you. Let's keep going. Got a couple more verses, and we'll just tie this this thought up here. Look at verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Here's here's my thought on this. That that being a follower of Jesus means giving hope in hard times. That's really what he's trying to say. We we share abundantly in Christ's suffering. We've we've seen that. Uh, We we appreciate that, and that's what Easter is all about. We also share abundantly in comfort too. (laughs) See, we, we get what Christ's suffering meant for us, the price that was paid for us. And in that, we are comforted. And so, so if we are comforted in that, then, then, it's, then it only stands to reason that we shouldn't just hold on to that, but to head on out and share that thought with other people too. So we, we share abundantly. Why? Because we've been given abundantly. It's when people need comfort the most that we're called to action. It's in these days that people just want to know they're going to be okay, that things are going to be okay, that we're going to get through this. And they need to know. They need to know how to have peace in the midst of this turmoil that they're living in. We have a message of hope and of comfort to share because of Jesus and what he's accomplished for us. Verse 6 is a challenging one to sort of think through, but let me just read you the whole thing, and then we'll just sort of look at what, it, what I think it's trying to communicate. If we're afflicted, this is Paul talking about himself uh, to them. He says, if we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently en- endure the same sufferings that we suffer. So what's he trying to say? Well, I think he's really trying to say, I want to give you hope. I want to bring words of comfort to you. And here's what it is. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If, if we're afflicted because of what we're doing, and that's to declare the good news of Jesus, and if, if that means we go to, to jail or we're imprisoned or we're persecuted or we're, 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 the horrible things are done to us, and there's a long list of things that happen to to Paul on that. Um, just be, be encouraged in that. Be comforted in that. Number one, that you've heard the good news about Jesus, and there should be comfort in that, that sins can be forgiven and hope of eternal life can be ours. But also find comfort in the fact that we don't have it as bad as him. We can look at Paul and go, wow, my situation's hard. I get that. And, I, and, and maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you're looking and going, my life is, is hard. But then I think of people that have lost loved ones in recent days. And they haven't been able to be there with them as they passed on. And I struggle with those that have been separated from from those that they care about. 
And, that, and maybe that's not your story. I, I heard of a missionary couple yesterday, in fact, that the husband and wife have been separated by, by distance because of this for over two months. So is what I'm suffering any worse than anybody else? No. In fact, we can look at others and say, you know what? I have a lot to be thankful for instead. That's sort of what Paul's saying there. And then he says this, and if we're comforted, then it's for your comfort too. In other words, if, if, Paul, is, if Paul can be comforted in the hard situations, then the God that it will comfort him will comfort me too. So, so I, I can claim that same promise that, that God's going to be with me no matter what the situation. And then he says, and, and you're experiencing that yourself. When you, when you go through the same stuff that Paul's going through, you see the same comfort that comes from God. Trust him. He's got it under control. He's the God who brings My name is Ron Herman and I'm a physiotherapist here in town. Robin and I have uh, six, six children and uh, we've been coming out to fellowship for 20 years as well. I think most recently it's been just trust. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will keep your path straight. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, just trust, especially in this crazy time we're going through here. I look at it right from being a young, a young guy in high school, year, in the 80s, thinking where I am now and where I thought I would be. I thought I'd be, you know, a retired professional athlete who's, uh, you know, well off and Robin be working as a veterinarian, so that would be, that'd be cool, you know, good income. But um, where he's brought us and just with personal conviction and uh, lots of prayer and trust, is someplace completely I didn't know we'd be. And it's great. One of the ways I really see God working in my life, I was always trying to get approval through sport. I figured, you know, my family and, you know, other people and playing football, you know, you had some approval. It was, it was, a, it was a positive thing. People, if you excelled at something like that, they uh, approved of you more. But God really used it rather than being something to glorify me. He used it to bring me across a bunch of great people over the years who love the Lord and who are bold enough to stand up and share their faith and tell me that faith in Jesus is, is the key. I grew up not knowing how to have that, that relationship with Christ, but rather trying to earn, earn that favor. And sport was just a tool God used and blessed me with the ability to do it, but in turn used it for bringing me to Him. And then Again, over the years, just learning that this isn't everything, but Christ is everything. He is faithful, and I don't have to do this on my own. Looking now with a guy who works with my hands, and I can't see people as a physiotherapist. I'm not allowed to. I'm paid percentage. You know, there's, he's blessing me with some little bit of work online, but it's just trust him, and I'm confident that somehow he will provide as you know, he'll take care of all of us. Just look to him and trust him and, hey, struggles are okay. But the big thing was learning to uh, just turn to him in prayer, trust him every day. Just turn to him with everything. Don't make a decision just based on worldly wisdom. Make a decision based on reading the word, praying to the Lord, praying together as a family, and then just trusting Him, even if it seems crazy. Even if it seems crazy what you decide, what, what God leads you to. And it could be different for everybody, but... Yeah, it's been an amazing, amazing ride over the years. So many uh, hard times and good times, and just... I just see the Lord working through it all to increase my faith and our family's faith. And I'm thankful for that. So there you have a story of someone that had to learn to trust, learn to trust in God and draw comfort out of that, trusting in, in someone other than themselves. And I, did you hear what, what Ron said? The, the, one, the one phrase that he said that just jumped out at me 
was this, struggles are okay. See, we want to live these lives, I think, sometimes that, that are free from aggravation and agitation. We want to live lives that are, that are free from conflict and crisis. We want to live lives that are sort of wonderful and, and no bumps in the road. And truth is, life's not like that ever. But in these days, it's really not like that. Life can be hard. Life is a challenge, usually on its best day. And struggles are okay. Because struggles that we go through point us to something outside of ourselves, drive us to something outside of ourselves. When, when, when I can't control things, when, when my life is sort of all stirred up, where do I go? It, we have to go outside of ourselves. When we can't control it, we go to a God who does. Turn to chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians for just a, a minute, and we're just going to look at a couple more verses here, but just remind us of, of this same truth, this whole idea of, of the comfort of God has to lead to action, and, and this whole idea that struggles are okay. Struggles are okay. See, the, the, the fact we're going through tough times doesn't mean God has abandoned us. In fact, we draw some encouragement in all of it. Chapter 4, we're going to look at uh, just starting at verse 7, and we're just going to look at a couple of verses here. Uh, and I'll just read them all, and then we'll, uh, then we'll look at them together. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Well, there's lots in there too, but I just wanted to draw some, some really quick thoughts and ideas that I hope will be an encouragement to you. The first thing we find in, in verse 7 is this. That we have this treasure. And that, that's the, the Apostle Paul is talking about the good news of Jesus. The, the fact that we get to share the hope and the peace and the comfort that we get through Christ with others. We get to share his story with others. That's the gospel. That's the treasure that we have. And, and so... The, the whole point is this, is, is if we understand what Easter's all about, if we understand what Jesus did for us and the hope that comes out of that, the whole idea of him paying the penalty for our sin on the cross and then ultimately rising from the dead to, to, to show his power and authority over death and the hope that it gives us, that's the gospel we get to share. And it's a treasure. It's a treasure because it's valuable. It's the, it's the life-changing, world-changing, world-shaking message of Jesus. And then it says this. We have the treasure is in jars of clay. Really fragile containers. And if, if, we're, if we are learning anything in these days, is that we're fragile, that we are temporal, that, 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 that these bodies can, can be destroyed really, really quickly, given the right set of circumstances, that, that it doesn't take much for our lives to be over. And so we learn that in, in really acute ways these days. Not that that's ever really not been the case, because we've always been fragile. We've always been these, these broken things that eventually wear out. It doesn't sort of matter how long we live. Ultimately, uh, the parts wear out. And so we have this great news in this this thing that's not going to last long. So I think if there's any message in that phrase, it's that, that, that we should share the hope of the good news of Jesus today because we don't know what tomorrow brings. We just don't know. And we have this treasure, this great story of hope 
in these containers that aren't going to be here for very long. And God designed it that way for now. Why? To show, look at what it says, to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So that any hope, any comfort, any, any, any change that could happen in our lives isn't a result of me or you or anybody else. It's what God does in the hearts of men. So that, so that he gets the glory, not us. Because we're just broken pots that he chooses to use. We have the treasure in jars of clay. And then he goes on and describes what we have to go through. Maybe this is the way you feel. So let me just read these verses um, really quickly for, you, for us and, and, and understand. There's, there's four sort of thoughts here. And, and, and we'll just look at them really quickly. We're, afflict, we're afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. That's verse 8. So, so here's, the, here's the first thought. We're afflicted. That, that, literally means, that literally means pushed into a narrow space. Um, pushed, pushed into a, a, a place that was like this at one point, is, it now becomes like this. And I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of get, the older, I guess I'm getting old. I don't know if, that, if that's a good thing or not, but as I get older, the whole idea of being stuck in small spaces really creeps me out. I think when I was little, it really didn't bother me. But now I like to watch, I watch a documentary on TV, like some guy going through a really narrow spot in a cave, and I, I start to get all squeamish. Like I'm starting to freak out. And, and I don't know. I hope that goes away, but it probably never will. But, but the point is, I think that sometimes we can, we can understand what it means to be pushed. We, we want space. And, and when space is taken away... It unsettles us. It unsettles us because because the, the fear is we're going to get stuck or we're going to get crushed or we're, something bad is going to happen to us. But look what it says. This this is what God does in our lives. The 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 the, the pressure we've been we've been funneled into a spot that we're not comfortable. That's probably the way you you feel today. That's probably the way our whole culture, our whole country feels today. We're we're stuck in a spot that we don't like very much. I don't know about you, but, but my house seemed bigger a couple months ago. Now it's like smaller than a shoebox. It kind of feels like this. We're afflicted in every way. We're, we're pushed into a narrow space. But, but look, look what it says, though. But we're not crushed. See, that's the, that's the preservation of God. It may feel like we're in this really challenging spot, but, but it's not to crush it. It's to give us a, a view of God, a picture of God, a trust in God, a hope in God that we need to have, even when it's hard. And then it says this, and we're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. A couple of these, these words here that get used... Um, are, are, are like wrestling terms, which would have been a, a, a classic thought or idea because that would have been one of the main sports. And you sort of think ancient Greece and the you know, Olympics, all that kind of stuff. And, and Greek wrestling was an important thing. So, we, so these were used there. And that word perplexed uh, is kind of one of those wrestling terms. It, 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 it means at a loss for a solution. Kind of like... If, if someone is wrestling with you and they've got a certain hold on you, you may get to a spot where you think, this is, this is hard and I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. And again, maybe that's the way we feel today. So, so what, what do I do about this? And, and so, so just so I can give up, but that's not the solution. In fact, it says this, that it says we're, we're perplexed, but we're not driven to despair. In other words, we don't give up. We don't give up. Why? Because we got a solution? No, but because we think God is bigger than anything we're going through right now. And so we need to trust him and wait for him. And the solution will come. The resolution will come. But it may not come in our timing. And it may not come in the form we want. But God is the one who will bring it eventually. So, so we're afflicted every way. Not crushed. Perplexed. But not driven to despair. We don't throw up our hands and say, I give up. 
It says this, we're persecuted but not forsaken, struck down and not destroyed in verse 9. It says that. The, the word persecution, um, we think of as, you know, people wanting to beat us up, to hurt us, to kill us, whatever it is. But, but it really means to be pursued actively. It's to, it's to push from behind. It's, it's really, again, going back to those, the way the Greeks would think was the idea of, the, of, a, of a race. And, and if you're out front and you're running along and things are going along great and you think you've got it all sorted out and all of a sudden you hear footsteps behind, what does that do to you? It pushes you forward. It, there's someone who is wanting to take over and I don't want them to get past me. And so this whole thing is being pushed from behind is to propel us forward. It's to push us um, a little harder because we don't want to be overtaken like in a race. It's to be pursued and the need for us to push on. And so I think that's really what we're trying to get at. This whole idea is that, that we are to push on no matter what comes. And then it says finally this, to be struck down but not destroyed. That's again one of those wrestling terms. You can sort of think of, of what we think of wrestling, but this whole idea of, of being taken from a standing position and thrown to the ground. And, and just the fact that we're thrown to the ground doesn't mean the story's over. It may seem like a violent action in the moment. It may seem like, like we would never, ever choose that. But it doesn't mean that the story is done. It's, it's I'm thrown down, yeah, but I get back up. I, I get knocked down, but it, that's not the end of the fight for me. I still have something more to give, and I'm still not done with the battle. The whole idea, that's what we want to do. That's the message, I think, the Apostle Paul's trying to communicate to the people at Corinth. Life is, life is hard sometimes. But we don't give up. Not because of what we've got. But we don't give up because we have a message of hope to share with people about Jesus and it's worth all the struggles and all of the stuff that we have to go through if it gives us a chance to share hope let's look at verse 10 it sort of wraps up his thought always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus may also be manifest in us we remember last, last week at Easter time we carry about the, the body and in, in, in ourselves, the death of Jesus. This whole idea that, that his death paid my penalty, my sin debt to a holy, righteous God. It was his death that, that allows me to have forgiveness of sins. And I carry that with me everywhere I go because I recognize, and I hope you recognize, your own brokenness, your own sinfulness that you can't fix. So we take everywhere with us the death of Jesus, his love for me on the cross, paid the debt I could never pay. I carry that everywhere. And why do I do that? So that the life of Jesus, look what it says, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in me to others. So that the, the, the life I get, the eternal life that I have, the hope of of eternal life, the hope of forgiveness, the, the peace that I have that people don't get in these situations, in the hardest of times, it, it lets me share hope because of what Jesus did for me. So that the life of Christ might be manifested in me. See, that's really the game plan of God. For us, to go through the difficult times. Not be exempt from them, but to go through them with the hope and the peace that comes from Jesus. And so if there's a mission for us as Jesus followers in these days, it's to carry the hope that comes through the death and the resurrection of Jesus that we personally experience. We get to share it, to make it manifest, to make it evident to others. So here's the, here's the takeaway. 
for you and for me this week, this week, who is it that you can share the difference that Jesus makes in your life with this week? Who can you share the message of hope and of comfort with this week? Go tell people about Jesus and make them famous. Thanks for being with us again this week. I hope the message has been one of encouragement to you. I hope you enjoyed the testimony and the, the music that we were able to share with you. If we can be of help, please don't hesitate to, to let the church know. Call us or email us, and we want to respond to your needs as, as best we can. Uh, in all of this, we want you to know that you're cared for and loved. God bless you as you go. We'll see you next week.